Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to everyone. Will you please join me in listening to today's prelude as we transition from a place of fellowship to a place of worship. Welcome to our service of worship and happy Mother's Day. Here we have gathered together to seek God in the midst of our lives. We've gathered together to seek and know the ways that God is at work in our world. We welcome you here no matter who you are. Indeed, we are thankful to God who made each of you who you are. Each one of you is made in God's image. And so each one of your presence is a gift to us in this shared time of worship. Welcome this morning to those of you who do the hard and faithful work of mothering. We celebrate you. Welcome to those of you who have lost a mother or lost a child. We mourn with you. Welcome to those of you for whom talk of motherhood is hard. Welcome to those of you who are expecting and anticipating motherhood. We wait eagerly with you. Welcome to all of you, no matter what. Here, God, the mother of us all, shelters us with love and surrounds us with care and gives us all we need each day. I pray that in our time of worship, we can find God in this place. Oh. 
Will you please rise and join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin? Lord, open our eyes, and our mouths will proclaim your praise. God, open your hands, and with them we will do the work of your kingdom. Spirit, open our hearts, and our souls will stir with love for you. When we gather at this font, we have a chance to see and to remember what it is that binds this community together. That across generations, the church is carried forward by what God will do here. Today, this child has come to the edge of these waters to step deeper into the life of this community and to join the pilgrim band of God's beloved. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is a mark of her acceptance into the care of Christ's church and a sign and seal of her participation in God's forgiveness and the beginning of your growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. So I ask you, Do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? I do. And do you promise by the grace of God to help her to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, and witness to the work of Jesus Christ in the world? We do. And do you promise to help her grow in Christian faith, 
to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence in the world. We do. Do you who stand as godparents promise to guide and encourage her by counsel and example and prayer with love to follow the way of Jesus Christ? To the congregation, will you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love, support, and care to those who are about to be baptized? If so, please say, we will. We will. We welcome you into the fellowship of Christ's church and invite you to share with us the cost and joy of discipleship. We promise to receive you as fellow pilgrims on the Christian way, to guide you by our precepts and example that all of us may grow in the knowledge and love of God according to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Will you pray with me? Bless by your Holy Spirit, O God, this water. Bring new life to those baptized here today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. See me? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> by what name will this child be baptized? Cecilia Jane, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, one God, the Mother of us all. The Holy Spirit be upon you, Cecilia Jane, child of God, disciple of Christ, and member of Christ's Church. You are God's beloved, and God delights in you. <laughs> get, it, get it both ways. <laughs> Will you join me in prayer? God, we give you thanks for the grace and love acknowledged here today in the water of baptisms. And we give you thanks for Cecilia Jane, your child, and now a disciple of Christ's church. And let all God's people together say, Amen. Now is a time when we all have a chance to share the peace and the love of God with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. I'd like to invite all the children to come forward and join me in the front. Good morning. Good to see everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Good? So I would like just a couple of people to tell me the best thing about your mom. Well, all right. 
She loves you. That's a great thing, yes. Someone else, the best thing about your mom. She brings you to all of your sports, yeah. That's a wonderful thing, a loving thing for a mother to do. Someone else, yes. She's caring, yeah. Anyone else something, the best thing about your mom? You get one more. <laughs> she, she takes you to your karate class, yeah. So I, I'll tell you what I'm hearing this morning. I'm hearing from you that your mothers are loving and they care for you and they take you places where you need to go, which is a great, you know, that, that may not be the thing that our moms, that might not be their first choice, what they wanted to do, but they do it for you. They do it for you because they want to help you learn and grow. Now, when I was growing up, I heard a lot of people in church talk about how God was like a father. Has anyone ever heard that before? God is like a father? Yeah. And there are a lot of great things about fathers that God definitely embodies. But I think God is also a lot like a mother. And when I heard you this morning talk about how your mothers were loving and caring and they did things for you to help you grow and become the people who you are becoming, it made me think that maybe God is like a mother too who cares for us and loves us and nurtures us. So on Mother's Day, let's think about God who is like our mother alongside God who's like our father. Let's say a prayer together. God, the mother of us all, we thank you for your love, your care, your nurture. Bless these children and bless us all with your powerful and holy love. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, and you can go to class now. As we prepare our hearts now to hear the word that God has for us in scripture, let us join our hearts in prayer. God, take hold of us in this time and do not let us go until we have been blessed by a vision of your love. Infinitely generous, gentle, and forgiving, simple, mysterious, and profound love in which all are accepted, love that never ends. Living God, love itself, speak now. Your people are listening. Amen.
Today's scripture comes from Acts 1, 1 through 14. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, the Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as her brothers. After Jesus had died, they buried him in a borrowed grave and rolled a stone over the door and sealed it shut. They walked away because they knew where he was. Dead and buried, sealed up, gone. But when a few women went back a few days later to anoint his body with fragrant spices to do the last things that human hands could do for their beloved teacher, he was gone. The Gospel of Luke tells the story this way. And the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are two chapters of the same story. The Gospel of Luke says, when they went to the tomb, they did not find the body. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling white clothes stood behind them. And the disciples were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you look for the living? among the dead. He's not here. He's risen. They were looking in the wrong place. He wasn't there. Jesus was out among the world, surprising people with amazing good news. And so began the ministry of the resurrected Christ, a man who would continue teaching and feeding. He met his friends on the road. He met them on a beach and in a locked upper room. He came back to them and reminded them of what life had been like before. He showed them the marks in his hands and his feet. He cooked them breakfast. He ate with them. 
And suddenly the darkness of those three days was lifting away, and the disciples, their joy was coming back, and their faith was gaining strength in a way they never knew was possible. Those disciples had gone down into the valley of death's shadow and emerged full of new life, and their ministry began to soar. Within days, those who had fled from the foot of the cross in fear were proclaiming the good news with a newfound boldness. They were binding together in community with newfound love. And as soon as it all started to feel maybe just a little too good to be true, Jesus left them again. Not into a tomb this time, but up into heaven. This Sunday on the church calendar is called Ascension Sunday. It is the last Sunday of the great 50-day celebration of Easter, the last Sunday to enjoy these white pyramids before we turn to the red of Pentecost. It's the day when we remember the last moment of Jesus' earthly ministry, the day that the risen Christ ascended into heaven. That's our story for this morning, from the very first chapter of the book of Acts. Jesus promised his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come he promised he would give them all they needed to continue doing the work that God was doing through them. And then after he had said all this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And then the story says this. And while he was going up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood behind them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Why are you looking for Jesus up there? He's not there. They were looking in the wrong place. No. Have you ever had your eyes fixed somewhere, or fixed on something where you were expecting God to come? Is there a certain horizon that you search day after day, waiting for everything that you've hoped for to peek into view? Are your prayers really specific? because you know what God ought to do next? Is there only one future that you see when you imagine success and happiness? Or are you open to a holy surprise? I ask because exactly one church year ago, one Ascension Sunday ago. I preached on this text at my old church in Wellesley. It was May 24th that year. It was four weeks before my last day with that job. And I had not yet received a call to another church. I was looking for what was, in my mind, the natural next step, an associate pastor position at a large church somewhere. And as the end of my time in Wellesley drew closer, week after week, people with wonderful intentions kept asking me if, they, if I knew what I was doing next. And I was ashamed because week after week, I had to paint on a smile and say, not yet, not yet. 
So I want to read you a little piece of what I said to my congregation that last year on Ascension Sunday. Just a little snippet. I said to them, as many of you know, my position here is ending on June 21st, and I'm searching for a job. And so far, I haven't found one. I remember that I had a catch in my throat when I said those words because I was really afraid. And I was embarrassed. And I continued, I said, when I'm feeling most anxious about that, I've tended to focus ever more intently and narrowly on the specific things that I'm trying to make happen, expecting that by narrowing in and digging in, I could make a job appear. And then I said this, maybe instead I should widen my view and prepare myself for some surprising possibility from God. Now, I want you to know that uh, preachers often joke with each other that we preach the sermons we need to hear, that really we're standing up here and trying to convince ourselves of something. And never in my life has that been more true than it was in that moment, because I didn't for a second believe that. And, and I want to tell you that any part of me that was able to hold that faith and hold that hope was formed in me by my mother. My mother, who took me to church, who taught me who God was, who sang hymns instead of lullabies, the only part of me that was able to believe that, even for a moment, came from her. That was one of the hardest sermons I've ever preached because every other person who'd been in my position at Village Church seemed to have simply strolled out the door into something perfect, and I was afraid that that wasn't happening for me. And this was the first time that I admitted it to the congregation. And I remember that I shook while I did. And imagine this too, at that church, the chairs were in a circle, there was no pulpit, and I was standing in the middle. The week leading up to that sermon, I had gotten a no from two different search committees, and I was rattled. But something else happened that week. I was here. I was here that week in Johnson Hall for the spring meeting of the Metropolitan Boston Association of the United Church of Christ a fairly boring <laughs> procedural meeting where we vote on the budget and elect, you know, you mean you know these church meetings. And we, the churches, take turns hosting them. And last spring, you hosted. And I was here. I led a worship service here for my colleagues, but some of you were there too. I was the last person to leave the building after that meeting. I was walking with our associate conference minister, Wendy Vanderhart, and I walked out the back doors into the parking lot, and I remember turning around and looking and wondering. I allowed myself to wonder just for a second if I might end up here. And I want to say, the part of me that could wonder such a thing was formed in me by my mother, who took me to church and sang me hymns instead of lullabies. 
But it didn't really seem possible. It didn't really seem possible that such a vital and exciting congregation would take a chance on someone like me. And most of my experience was in a much larger church, and so I wondered if you would even give me a second look. Not to mention the fact that I was starting to believe what every other committee said to me. He's too young. <laughs> so the thought passed me over. But, <laughs> as it turns out, here I am. And I hope you know what I now believe, that through it all, through all the hard interviews and the knee-shaking sermons in front of my old congregation, that this was the call that was waiting. I believe in my bones that this is where I'm meant to be, that this is all God's crazy idea. Here's what happened in Scripture. People were looking everywhere for Jesus. They were looking in tombs. They were looking up in the sky. I suspect they probably went back to the beach, too, and maybe to the locked room. But really, what they were searching for was a future that they could see that would hold them in a moment when they were shaken to their core. Everyone, not just the disciples, everyone was looking for hope and a new future. They were pouring back over old books, trying to reform old institutions, turning to the experts that helped them out so well in the last crisis. And while all of these people were looking everywhere for God's future, and they were looking in the right places, or what they thought were the right places. Two angels came and said, why are you looking there? Look over here. Look around you. Look at these people. Look at this community. Look at the way that they care for each other and love each other, look. Look again. It could be that the future that God is creating is right here in front of you, and it's been right here all along, not off in the distance, not up in the sky, right here. Is there a certain horizon that you search day by day, waiting for everything that you ever hoped for to peek into view? Have you ever been tempted to think that if you just put your head down and narrow your focus and push a little harder, you can make the right thing happen? Have you ever turned back to old ways in the midst of stress, letting some familiar or unhealthy comfort ease the pain of uncertainty and confusion? Have you ever felt like you're looking in the wrong place? Well, two angels have a question for you. Why are you looking there? Look here. Widen your gaze. Don't just look for God as some beacon burning clearly off in the distance. Look for God as the untamable flames of new life dancing in your midst. You might say something or hear something brand new. You might find out that your whole life is about to change. You might find out that you're on the right path after all, and God is closer than you imagined. That's the Holy Spirit for you. She dances where she wants. 
She stirs up trouble in the middle of our best laid plans. She disrupts our certainty and disturbs our clarity. And she is Christ's greatest gift to us, the Holy Spirit. I think of her like those two angels tapping on our shoulders and saying, look over here. Before we begin our normal time of prayer, we have a special prayer to say this morning for a member of our congregation. Many of you know that a year ago, Andrea Butterfield Robert lost her brother unexpectedly and suddenly. Yesterday, her family gathered to bury his ashes at Wildwood Cemetery in Amherst. In speaking with Andrea, we agreed that it would be appropriate this morning for all of us to say a prayer since none of us could be there at the graveside. So this is the prayer that I would say if I was there, and I'd like us to say it together now. So will you please join me in prayer? Humbly we stand in the face of death this day, O God, but confidently we stand with life. We praise you with tender hearts and with faith in your great mercy. God of our beginnings and endings, receive now Matthew Ward Butterfield, our brother in life and your beloved child, earth to earth and dust to dust. With thanksgiving for all that he was, we commend him to your eternal care with sure and certain hope that you will welcome him into your arms of mercy. Receive him now into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and the company of all the saints. In Christ's name, we confidently pray. Amen. We turn now to the prayers of our community gathered here today. If you have a prayer, concern, or joy that you would like to share with us, you can do so now.
Prayers for a friend of Mary's diagnosed with cancer this past week, Cheryl. Prayers, prayers for Christine, whose brother has died recently and whose sister is now terminally ill. Let us join in prayer. God of all our lives, God of our beginnings and endings, we see the way that you are at work in our world. Help us to sense your healing love when it comes to us, your peace and your mercy when it is before us. God, on this Mother's Day, we give thanks for the wisdom that you have placed into this world through the hearts and lives of those who mother and care for us. We thank you for the ways that their lives live in ours, for the ways they shaped us into who we are. Bless all of us now, God, with your mothering love. Surround us with comfort and care and strength and vision. Bless all your people this day, Holy One, in Christ's name we join our voices in the prayer he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to our time of offering, and I just want to begin with a couple of brief announcements. First, a uh, youth group will be meeting next week, middle and high school youth group. Uh, details about that in your bulletin. My installation is on May 22nd. You've heard enough from me about that, but just another reminder, it's in your bulletin. This week is the last week that the choir will be singing with us this year. So I want, uh, if the choir folks who are still up there, just step to the edge of the uh, balcony so that we could uh, see you. And let's just take a moment to thank them for the gifts that they've given us this year. Our offering is an opportunity to express our gratitude for the ways that we are met here with God's love. Please give generously out of all that you have received. Our morning offering will now be given.
God, we thank you for the gifts of your people, given in hope of all that we can do together to make your love come alive in this world. Bless these gifts now and bless each of us. In Christ's name, amen. And now let us join and sing hymn number eight, Joyful, Joyful, and we'll sing verses one and four.
may be seated. Friends, our church family is always changing. People come and go, babies are born, children grow up. People commit themselves to one another, loved ones come to the end of their lives. Individuals move into our community and church lives, and others leave, moving away to new places, new experiences, and new opportunities. It is important and right that we recognize not only those times of beginnings, but also those times of endings. And so today, we share this time of farewell with Elizabeth Mosick. Elizabeth has served as the Director of Operations and Finance for our church for 11 years and has been critical in the strong relationship that we now enjoy with the Center School, a cornerstone of our mission in this community. Elizabeth is now getting ready to go to the Cape where you have bought and will be operating a bed and breakfast in an old sea captain's home. So we wanted to just take an opportunity here to thank Elizabeth for her wonderful, faithful, and dedicated service to this church and to uh, offer our appreciation and gratitude for all that you've done for us. So as a, as a token of, of our appreciation for your service, we have two gifts for you, and one of them is very heavy, so I'm not going to hand it to you. But, what that um, is. <laughs> so um, first we have, this is a, a gift for you, a gift certificate to White Flower Farm, oh, which... no place I love more we, than that, except for the except church. For the church right? <laughs> uh, so so we, we, we hemmed and hawed about getting oh, you some sort of plant, perfect. and then we realized that wouldn't you love to choose your own. <laughs> Um, I also had this stone made for you to place in your garden. It's a verse of scripture. It says, ask the plants of the earth and they will teach you that the hand of the Lord has done all this. Aww. So our, our I can relate to me more than that. <laughs> our hope it is that whatever it is that you uh, find with that gift card will uh, plant beside this stone and be a reminder that uh, the seeds that have been planted here in our life together will continue to bear fruit for many years. Oh, I have no more wish than that. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much. Um, is this on? Oh, yes. I'm loud enough anyway, so I don't really need this. But <laughs> it's certainly with mixed emotions that I leave the church that I love so very much. When Jay and I joined the church, and William was a wee lad, hard to imagine looking at that six foot six hulking Nordstrom. <laughs> Nordstrom, no, a Nordsman. <laughs> um, and after, I think it was about 15 years ago we joined the church, and then at 11 years that I've been an employee, I could never have imagined the connection I would feel with such an amazing, caring community of people. I feel so blessed and loved. Thank you. And we've, we've shared some sad times, certainly, some very interesting times, without a doubt, but mostly we've shared many, many joyous, joyous, joyous occasions, and I feel so connected and blessed to be part of your lives, and you will always be there. There's a bond. I think when you work for a church that obviously you don't have with other places, that you were just connected to the people, and that bond I will carry with me always. I feel, as I said, very blessed, and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Just stay up here with me. And now will you please rise to receive our benediction. And this is a benediction for, for all of us, but especially also for you. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's beautiful face shine upon you and bring you peace wherever you may go, this day and all the days of your life. In Christ's name we confidently pray. Amen.